morning, church family. We're meeting again online, but it's good to have you here with us. I'm so excited to see how our church family is responding to one another and trying to keep connected. And I think it's very important for us to do that. And you're doing it very well. And uh, also, I want to thank you for being faithful. I pray that uh, you will understand how important it is to be faithful with your tithes and your offerings because the load on the church has actually increased, not decreased. And I know it's a little difficult, but uh, please make that effort as it enables us to go forward. And I really want to brag on our staff. Uh, our staff has been doing a tremendous job. Again, their load has gone up, not down. While some people are getting time off, we're not really getting time off. We're actually working harder and spending more time. But uh, that's, that's part of our privilege. And, uh, but I want to thank the staff. They've been very creative. They've been uh, very proactive. And uh, I'm just so grateful, especially our tech staff and Grant and all those in his team and, and the creative team with Pastor Dave. Uh, it's just been amazing to see how they've all stepped up. And uh, so I just want to say thank you to them. We're continuing to have staff meeting on our Tuesday mornings. Uh, even though our staff is uh, larger than 10 in a room, uh, we use a large enough room we can do a little social distancing. So we're trying to kind of obey the rules, but, but keep the wheels on and keep moving. This morning, I want to talk to you about never wasting a trial, never wasting a difficult circumstance. Now, I know that there are people with bad motives, uh, even Marxists who have taught the idea that you never waste a crisis. It's a time when you can kind of get your agenda in, and we've seen a little bit of that going on in Washington, D.C. this week. But uh, the point is, there's a good principle there that we should all understand uh, because God never wastes a trial. If we'll give it to him, he does something good with it, not only in our life, but also through the life of others. God is very concerned about that. And I want to start off this morning by sharing a little story with you. It's a true story. It's about a man who uh, found the cocoon of an emperor moth that had not yet opened. And so he was uh, very excited about it. They're a very beautiful moth, they're very large, and he, he decided to take it home and hang it up in a safe place and, and wait for it to, to open because he wanted to see this, this wonder of nature as it emerged from the, uh, from the cocoon. Well, the time came and the moth, you could see, you could tell, was starting to eat away at the cocoon and there was a small opening that was made. And then the moth started struggling to get through that opening. And as the man watched, it struggled and struggled and struggled for hours and could not get very far. It just made very incremental progress. And the man began to feel sorry for it, thinking it was something was wrong. So uh, he finally decided to help it. And so he got some scissors and he snipped the rest of the cocoon. Well, of course, the moth emerged very, very quickly. But when it did, he noticed something was wrong. The moth's body was very swollen and bulky, and its wings, which would normally be beautiful and large and eventually would uh, dry out and fan out uh, to give it its beautiful power of flight, were very shriveled and wrinkled and small. What he had unwittingly done is he had stopped a process of struggle that was very important for that moth. It needed to struggle for hours and hours and hours to get through that small opening because it pushed the fluid that was in its body out of its body into its wings so that its wings would spread and then ultimately become those beautiful uh, wings that would be instruments of flight. He had unwittingly destroyed the moth's ability to ever fly and it would live and die without ever being able to manifest its true nature. Sometimes we don't realize how much we need each, uh, for God to allow us to go through difficult times. It's never fun. We don't like to do it. But you see, God is very concerned about His church and about us becoming like Christ and about us reaching the lost through our Christ likeness. And during times like this, He's working on both of those and using times like this, to accomplish in us something that might not otherwise uh, happen. There's an amazing passage of Scripture that I want us to walk through together. 
that unpacks an awesome truth about how God grows us and uses us to win people to Christ when we go through difficult trials, uh, difficult situations, even persecution. Uh, I want you to look with me at 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 12 through chapter 4, 12. Now, we're not going to read all that in the beginning because uh, I don't want to do that. But what we're going to do is instead, we're going to read it as we walk through it this morning and kind of unpack this beautiful truth. Now, the reason we're doing this is because we need the context to get the kind of the punch point at the end. And it is a beautiful truth about what God does in our lives and what He does through our lives when we're in difficulties and hardships. And that's what we've all been going through. Now to communicate this truth, the Apostle Paul begins in 2 Corinthians 3, 12, 18, by explaining how God works to create in us the ministry of reflection, reflecting the glory of God. And uh, so as we read through this first section and I hope you have a Bible. I'd, I'd love for you to go get it. If you have it on your iPhone, your iPad, uh, you know, surely you have a Bible lying around, maybe one you use for devotion. Go get it. It would be good to have as we walk through this passage because you'll be able to follow Paul's argument and see this incredible truth that emerges at the end of this passage. And so read with me as we begin uh, reading about uh, this reflection and how he, he puts a story in here from the Old Testament about how people lost the ability to see and understand and reflect God's glory. And so we begin in verse 12 of uh, chapter 3 of 2 Corinthians. He says, Therefore, since we have this better hope, we are very bold. And, and when you see therefore, you have to stop and ask, what's it there for? And he's been talking about how the new covenant in Christ is so much better than the old covenant. The old covenant is fading and passing away. This one isn't fading and passing away. And it has power that the other covenant didn't have. So he goes on, he says, We are not like Moses who would put a veil over his face so the people of Israel would not see the glory even though it was destined to fade away. But the people's minds were made dull and hardened. And to this day, the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. And because of it, they cannot understand the truth. This veil has, been re has not been removed from them because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts and they do not understand. But whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now, the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And all of us who now have unveiled faces can see, contemplate, and reflect the Lord's glory. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, is transforming us into His likeness by taking us from one level of glory to another, ever increasing glory. What an incredible concept, ever increasing glory. Now the first thing we see in verse 12 is the hope we have through the new covenant. Paul is saying that we have a hope that will not fade like the old covenant did. Then in verses 13 through 15, he talks about the veil that covered their hearts and minds. And that's, of course, symbolic of the blindness that came over Israel and was over their hearts and minds during the time of Christ. They could not see the glory of God in Christ, though he put it on display. Then in verse 16, it talks about the fact that only in Christ is this blindness removed, the veil taken away. This is the hope we have when people turn to Christ. Why? Because in the Spirit of Christ, there is freedom from blindness. And he talks about how by the Spirit we become those whose faces are unveiled and our sight suddenly is there. We're no longer blinded. We're no longer kept from the truth. And then in verse 18 he says this amazing thing. That those who come to Christ not only see, they have unveiled faces that now reflect the Lord's glory. Just like Moses' face shown because he had been in the presence of God, the presence of Christ, our faces and our lives shine because of the presence of the Spirit living in us. 
So our lives put Christ's glory on display. We can now reflect God to the world. So, in 2 Corinthians 4, 18, uh, all of us who now have unveiled faces can see, contemplate, and reflect the Lord's glory. That's what he's talking about. This is done by constantly transforming us more and more into Christ's likeness. The latter part of verse 18 says this, And the Lord, who is the Spirit, is transforming us into His likeness by taking us from one level of glory to another, ever-increasing glory. So first, there are those who have their faces unveiled. That's the believers. That's us. And they become those who reflect the glory of Christ to the world by having His Spirit living in them. So, we are now ready for an understanding of how we walk into the circumstances of this Satan-controlled world and deal with helping blind people see and people who do not speak the language of the truth, except as we will see in a very narrow area of life, to get a translation of truth they can comprehend. This leads us to our ministry. That's the next thing Paul wants to put in front of us. And he does that in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 4 as it transitions. Remember, there's no chapter division when Paul wrote this, but the transition is here. And here's what he says. Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this new way to minister, we do not lose heart. Rather, we have rejected all shameful procedures and underhanded methods We don't need them, is what he's basically saying. So we don't use destructive or deceptive tricks, nor do we distort the Word of God. On the contrary, by telling the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to every person's conscience in the sight of God. So Paul is saying that we have a ministry that is a new way of reaching people. What is that ministry? reflecting through our transformed lives the truth of who Christ is. What an incredible thought. In verse, the latter part of verse 1 there, he says, this is the very difficult world in which we have to minister to people who cannot see or hear the truth. We do not lose heart. Why do we not lose heart in this difficult world where people are blind, their faces are veiled, they, they can't perceive truth? Well, he's going to tell us. We'll we'll see a very encouraging truth about that in a moment. But we might ask, you know, they're still blind, they're still deaf, but hold on. In verse 2 he says, we therefore don't have to communicate our message to the world the way those of the world communicate their false messages. We keep a holy and upright life. In other words, our transformed life on display as we minister in this new way. Paul is, however, very intent on us understanding the difficulties we face in trying to reach others. This leads us to his next real important transitional point, and that is the situation. The situation. We've seen the reflection we're supposed to have. We've seen the message we have. But now the situation in which we have to communicate that message. And that's in verses 3 and 4 of chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians. He goes on and says this, and even if the good news we preach is hidden behind a veil, it is hidden only from people who are perishing. Because the God of this age, Satan, has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel about the glory of Christ, who is the exact image of God. You see, We have a simple story with a problem. It is a beautiful and wonderful story, and it's the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes it, according to Paul in Romans 1.16. But the very ones who need it are blind to its glory, its truth, and its power. They are deaf to its language of truth. The cross should open our eyes to God's amazing love and passionate desire for the salvation of everyone. In fact, 
there is a wonderful verse in the Apostle Peter's second letter, which we often quote but seldom fully understand. It is 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. He says, The Lord is not slow in keeping His promise, as some understand slowness. He's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Now we get the part about God wanting everyone to come to repentance. That is a glorious truth, and it's confirmed everywhere in the Bible, in the New Testament. However, we miss the immediate context that makes this statement even more amazing and calls to us Christians to realize how dedicated God is to using us to reach those who have not yet repented. And here it is. In this passage, Peter is speaking about God's de delaying Jesus' coming. Some wanted to know why he had not come yet. Peter's answer, God is not slow about Jesus coming or in keeping his promise to come and set the world right and judge the wicked and, and uh, create the new heaven and the new earth. Rather, he's being patient with us, us Christians. Here's what he said. He is patient with you, the believers Peter is writing to, because he wants all to repent and to be saved. So, here's the point. You and I need to realize how committed God is to reaching the world. He is literally delaying the coming of Jesus so that more and more people can come to eternal life. Now, what I want us to see is how God uses times like we're in right now, and even more difficult times, to enable us not only to grow in our spiritual development, but also to use our lives to reach the world. In fact, right now, you should be praying every day that God's love and grace will be so evident in and through your life that those who do not know Christ, that come into contact with you, will be deeply impacted by your love, your graciousness, and the peace, and the strength, and the unfailing hope they see in you. This is because God is using this crisis to wake some people up to what is truly important. And people are more open to the truth now than at other times. And if they see God's grace and truth actually working in amazing ways in the life of a Christian, it has a deep impact that can lead to their conversion through the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, we're going to see how God does this. But first, to understand it, we need to understand the problem realistically. We need to realize that act, the actual nature of people's blindness so that we can understand how God wants us to reach them with the good news. And that's where Paul turns to next. So let's look at the situation we are all faced with as we work for our king in this world corrupted and enslaved to Satan and his lies. First, we see that Paul points to what we can call minds without eyes. When Paul informs us that the minds of unbelievers have been blinded, he uses uh, very exacting language. The Greek word for blinded is to flao. Uh, this word comes from the word to floss. It sounds like the English to floss, but it's to floss. Uh, which means to make opaque, uh, as if smoky. Both of these words mean to make blind. But when we go a little further into the history of these words, we find that they both come from the word tufao, which comes from the word for smoke. And tufaho and its literal meaning is to envelop with smoke. And what is most revealing is that this word, Tufao is also figuratively used in the Bible to mean to be inflated with self-conceit, high-minded, and filled with pride, and to be unteachable. And so, what's he saying? Satan blows smoke into their minds and into their thinking, so they can't think straight. So they can't see and respond to the glory, or the, rather the message of Christ. 
They can't see what they should see. And that leads to not only minds without eyes, it leads to the next thing, the master unperceived. This means that the truth about our Lord and master Jesus Christ, which is so glorious to us, is imperceptible to them. They don't see any gospel. They see no gospel, no good news. They cannot see, he says, they cannot see the light of the gospel, verse 4. As far as the unbeliever is concerned, they see no good news in the cross. And they see no glory. That's what he says. He says, they cannot see the light of the glory of Christ, who is the exact image of God. When they look at Jesus, they cannot discern reality. They do not see God in the flesh. They see maybe a good man, a good teacher. Maybe some think they see an imposter or a madman, but not God incarnate. In our study passage, Paul is concerned with how we are to minister to the world around us the knowledge of the good news concerning the glory of Jesus Christ as God in the flesh, crucified, risen, and exalted for our salvation. If the God of this age, Satan has such power to blind men's minds, their hearts, then how are we to fulfill our commission to make disciples of all nations? Because that is what we're called to do. How do we pierce this darkness? Or to put it another way, if they have been brought to confusion and can no longer hear the voice of truth, how do we translate the truth into a language they can understand? Because they don't speak the language of truth. What Paul is going to teach us in this passage has the power to change the world. His instruction will point to the fact that there is a way to penetrate this darkness. But it takes more than words. It will take our lives. So what is the solution to this situation? Well, he begins that in verse 5 and 6 of the fourth chapter. So here's what he says. We don't go around preaching about ourselves. We preach that Jesus Christ is Lord, and we ourselves are your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has in the same way caused his light to shine in our hearts so that we are given the light that leads to the knowledge of God's glory that is displayed in the face, the very life of Christ. So what Paul is going to point to here is two things. He's saying that first of all, we're going to put on display the transparent self. Paul says, I don't go around preaching about myself. I don't put myself out there. I don't want people to see me. He said, I preach Christ. I preach him crucified. I preach him as Lord. I preach him as the Savior of the world. And letting Christ be seen is what's important in our lives. So the transparent self, getting self out of the way, that's the key. And then Paul is going to talk about the transformed self, being transformed so that the nature, the light of Jesus is seen in us. This lifts up Christ so that he can draw men to himself. And if we are truly being transformed into his image, then we will be seen embracing a sacrificial life that looks like the sacrificial life of Christ. Remember what Jesus said? He said, if I be lifted up from the earth, and he's talking about his crucifixion, I will draw all men to myself. And some people say, well, then why are not all men being drawn to Christ? Why, why is not all mankind receiving? Well, we forget that he reveals further on that he wants to be lifted up not only on the cross, but also on the life of his church. He says, I will build my church and the gates of Hades, the gates of the dead, the gates of those in bondage to death will not be able to withstand it. And the church is to lift Christ up. And so Christ wants to be lifted up through our transformed lives. So Paul often points to this. Some of his amazing statements that drive this home are found in the letters to the Colossian church, the Philippians church, the Roman church. And let, let me give you a couple of them. For example, he says in Colossians 1.24, Now I rejoice in what was suffered for you, and I fill up in my flesh 
what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. So what is Paul saying there? He's not saying that Christ's sufferings aren't through. No, that's finished. That's a finished work. But he's saying that the sufferings on the cross, while they're finished and atonement is done, that Christ is still working and he's still suffering through his church to get that message and that good news to the world. And Paul says, I'm, in, I'm involved in that, the afflictions of Christ, that he's still working by his spirit through us to get the good news to those who need to hear it and to break through their blindness. He says, I'm part of that. Uh, to the Philippians, in Philippians 1.29, he said this, For you have been given not only the privilege of trusting in Christ, but also the privilege of suffering for him. Wow. Uh, do we think of suffering with Christ as a privilege? I, I, I doubt it. But the truth is, if we suffer with him, then we really are his friends. We really are in the trenches with him. We are workers together with God. Paul said it this way in Romans 8, 17. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. Wow, share in his sufferings so that we may also share in his glory. And while most of this suffering for him will come from the evil world, you also need to know that God will also use redemptive discipline that often feels very painful and is to do something very important in making us strong as, we, as strong as we need to be to survive with our faith in this evil world. For example, let me give you an illustration. Uh, a man remembered seeing uh, a young giraffe born in the wild. And he was amazed how this process took place as the young giraffe was born and fell onto the ground. Uh, of course, it's, it's all legs and it's all eventually gets up where it can uh, at least set upright with its legs folded under it. But he noticed that the mother got over the young giraffe and just kind of stood over it for about a minute. And then it, she did the most counterintuitive thing he could imagine. She, she took one of her long legs, and she kicked that young giraffe just sprawling across the land, just boom, tumbling. And she kept doing that until he finally got up and got to his feet because she wanted him to learn how to get to his feet quickly. Secondly, once he got to his feet, she knocked his feet out from under him, so he had to do it again. And she kept doing this and doing this until he was quick to get up and quick to start moving around. Why? Why was she doing that? Well, you see, there is no way that that young giraffe was going to survive unless it could get up quickly and stay with the herd where there was safety from the lions and the leopards and the hyenas and the wild dog packs who love young giraffe. And its only safety was to stay with the herd. And if it could not get up quickly and be able to move, so that mother imposed some pretty harsh discipline immediately to save the giraffe's life, to make it strong. It isn't always necessary, but sometimes God has to do something like that to help us be able to deal with the environment of the lions and the wolves and the lepers that we live in the midst of. In fact, Justin Martyr talked about how God uses this to make us strong and how that results in our being a testimony to Christ. Justin Martyr himself, who was born in A.D. 114, just shortly after the death of the very last of the 12 apostles, John, and would himself later die as a martyr in A.D. 165 under Marcus Aurelius, he pointed out that the persecution of the early church by the Roman Empire only led to more people becoming Christians because of the grace that God was witnessing to, as people saw the grace of God witnessed through the Christian's life as they died with joy, hope, courage, and forgiveness for those who were murdering them. He stated that for every Christian that was killed in the arena, he believed around six took 
their place by conversion. That's, that's incredible. I think Satan figured that out real quick and decided, you know, i got to change my tactics. So he quit killing the church, and then he joined the church. And, of course, that created a totally different situation. The next thing we see is the similitude. Now, the similitude means something that, that is like something else. And in verses 7 through 12, Paul begins to talk about how we are able to do something similar to what Christ does. And in so many ways, our becoming and being like Jesus is at the heart of communicating the hope of the gospel to those in the darkness. It is more than what we say. It is what we are and what we do as we say it. That's what's important. Uh, Some people say it. You know, (laughs) what you are and what you do is so loud, I can't hear what you're saying. And it can be true. If our lives and our message does not line up, we're not going to have an impact. And in fact, the only way our words carry meaning and power is through the Holy Spirit and through the transformed life He's producing through us, the changed attitudes, the sacrificial love that others actually experience through us. Because that is the Spirit of Christ. Now, what Paul's going to point to here is the treasure. Look at verse 7. He says, But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. Now, we need to know what this treasure is. But that means we need to go back and do a little quick reminding of ourselves of what we just looked at when we started in... 2 Corinthians 3.12, and up to that point. And, uh, and so if you remember that Paul was talking about that we are able to reflect the glory of God as we uh, are being transformed into His likeness. And so this is what Paul is referring to when he says, we have a treasure. What is this treasure? This treasure he's speaking of is that Jesus has made it possible for us to reflect His glory to the world. That's our ministry, he says in verse 1 as he transitions into the fourth chapter. Jesus came with a treasure. Jesus came with a gift for the world, which was Himself. According to John 6, 51, He said, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. We come with a treasure too. Our treasure, like his, was in a jar of clay. He was put, he has put this treasure in us by his spirit in two ways. First, we have the knowledge of Jesus. That's revelation. We, we know who He is. When we look at Jesus, we see God in the flesh. Our eyes have been opened. The veil's been removed from us. That was, and then the power of Jesus, the, the transformation which has happened in our lives as we have begun to look more and more like Jesus being moved from glory to glory with ever-increasing glory as we are daily becoming more like our Lord. For us, the treasure is the knowledge of who Christ is, which we reflect to the world by our continual transformation. But it is left in a jar of clay. (laughs) Uh, Jesus came in a jar of clay. Uh, Our jar of clay is a little worse. Uh, We're crack pots, as someone has said. In fact, I remember teaching a conference and uh, in one of the breaks, I'd been teaching on this concept that we are crackpots. And someone came up and put a little piece of paper on my podium and said, uh, got a new term for you. And on it, I looked at it and it said psychoceramic. <laughs> and, and I started laughing. He said, yeah, that's what we all are. We're all crackpots. And he said, uh, but he said, isn't it interesting, like you've been teaching, the light shines through the cracks best. Through our weaknesses and our difficulties, God actually causes the treasure inside to be seen. For what? To show people where the all-surpassing power comes from. Not from us, but God. We're not trying to uh, you know, impress people with who we are. If we're doing that, we've totally missed it. We, we have no clue. 
But we're trying to get people to see the treasure in us, which is this incredible power of the Spirit living inside, transforming us and reflecting to them the opportunity to be transformed themselves. Now, the next thing, though, that Paul wants us to understand is that we have to make this treasure known. There are two metaphors that help us understand what Paul is about about to now reveal to us about how we make this treasure that we have known. And they are the metaphors of seeing and perceiving and hearing and understanding. Seeing and perceiving, hearing and understanding. Both need a translation into a form that the unbeliever can see hear, and understand. In a sense, we're going to do something very important to make that possible according to what Paul is going to teach us. Unbelievers do not speak the language of truth except where the realities of life force them to do so. You see, often unbelievers deny truth. They deny reality until it comes crashing in after they make some bad choices and the consequences show up and payday comes. And that's where sometimes God uses that to wake them up to the fact that there really is truth and they do have to answer to it. And he's going to do that in their lives and he's going to do it through our lives in a way that helps them to see that the message we have is genuine. So the first thing we're going to see here is the translation the translation, how God is going to translate what they can't see and understand and hear and understand into a form that they can see and understand, into a language, so to speak, that they do speak. Uh, Look at verses 8 through 10 of 2 Corinthians 4. He says, we are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. Now notice the first thing he says. He says, we're hard pressed. The world looks at that and says, look at them, they're hard pressed. They're going to be all upset just like we are. But Paul says, but we're not crushed. They look at us and say, you you should be crushed. But he says, we're not crushed. What's happening here? They're starting to see something other than us, though they may not realize it yet. And the world takes note that we should have been crushed, but, hmm, interesting. But we've got their attention. Then he says, next, we're perplexed. (laughs) Perplexity is one of the most difficult things to deal with in life. Uh, Not knowing who you are, not knowing where you're going, not knowing what life is all about, not knowing if there's life after death, not knowing if your life has any meaning. Perplexity. And so many people end up in depression and despair. But Paul says, we're not in despair. We're not in depression. And they wonder why. We have this strength not to be depressed. They're going, that's weird. They should be depressed just like all the rest of us get. But they're not. Paul says, and then it's ramped up a little more. We are actually persecuted. And the world says, oh, now they'll feel abandoned. Now they'll start singing the woe is me and start sucking their thumb. And, you know, but he says, but we're not abandoned. We know that God is still with us. We're never abandoned. He will never leave us. He'll never forsake us. And they say, this really is strange. They should be singing the blues. Why are they not singing the blues? He says, and then, sometimes it even goes to this extreme. We are struck down. And the world says, that'll do it. They'll be destroyed. That'll end their faith. That'll end their confidence. That'll put an end to their hope and their good news. And Paul says, but we are not destroyed. And they come asking, where does your strength come from? How is it that you can respond like this? And what is our answer? Well, here's what it should be. What you see is his strength, which you claim, maybe you claim doesn't exist. But now you know it must. 
because it is being manifested through my body and through my life and through my soul. You see, the very thing they claim doesn't exist, the treasure inside of you is what they're seeing. And it's being put into a language they understand. They understand hardship. They understand difficulty. They experience that too. That kind of truth breaks through. And when they see it in our life and see that we respond very differently, they go, what's going on here? What is it they have that I don't have? Thus we have been used of God to translate the glory of His person and power into a realm of truth they can comprehend. And they are forced by life to comprehend hardship and trouble. And so it becomes a language they understand. This is the language of the cross in which people can look at that and see the love of God that they just couldn't comprehend before. This is redemptive sacrifice for Christ's sake, His kingdom. And we're called to be willing to suffer like this, if necessary, to reach someone and change their eternal destiny. Would it be worth going through some suffering if it changed somebody's forever? If it kept somebody from suffering forever because they came to the good news of the gospel? Now Paul distills it into a general spiritual principle. He loves to do that. And... Uh, and he's saying that this principle works in and through us to reach others who need to come to life through the good news of the gospel on display in our lives. And so he now talks about the transposition, the transposition. In verses 11 and 12, here's what he says. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that His life may be revealed in our mortal body. So then, death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. Do you see the principle? Death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. Our mortal bodies have a purpose in the here and now. God left you in a cracked pot. Why? So that when he put the treasure in you, it could shine through. And where does it shine through best? Not through your strength. Oh, God uses those too. But it's often through your weakness, through your difficulties, through your hardships. And when you are an overcomer, the world goes, wow, what's going on here? There's something other than natural strength. There's something other than natural human nature on display here. And through this, we communicate his life to others by this death, this affliction, this sacrifice that's at work in us. So it's important for us to see that God wants not only to reach the world, he wants to reach the world through us. And he wants the transformation in us that enables us to be overcomers. And sometimes he allows us to go through things ahead of time just so that we will be prepared to be those vessels that can put his glory on display through our mortal bodies. The Apostle Paul talks about how this was true for him. He, he actually had a time in his life when he, he, he wanted God to take a, his weaknesses and a particular weakness away. You're all familiar with it probably. 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10. It's just a few chapters down from here. Uh, and then you could turn over there. And, and we're going to read that passage just right now. Just, just look at what Paul says. Because he's talking about, Lord, I've got this weakness in my life. I've got this problem, this, this thorn in my flesh, this pain, this difficulty. I, I want you to take it away. Here's what he says, is to keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations. Now stop right there. What Paul is saying is, God had given me these incredible revelations about heaven and the coming of Christ and the end time that the church needed. But in a sense, he said to him, Paul, I, I need to get these revelations to the church, but you're going to have to suffer as a result of it because they're so great, they would make you conceited. So I'm going to give you something to keep you from becoming conceited. <laughs> And so he says, because of these surpassingly great revelations, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, in other words, in my body, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. 
But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. Now listen to this. For my power is made perfect in weakness. That's what Jesus said to Paul. My grace is sufficient for you. Right now, what we're going through, his grace is sufficient. If you're sick, his grace is sufficient. If you're bored because you can't do the things you want to do, his grace is sufficient. Uh, For Christians who are suffering persecution in many parts of the world, his grace is sufficient. For his power is made perfect, what, in our talents and abilities? No, in our weakness. Now, that's what Jesus said to Paul. Now I want you to notice how Paul responded. He said, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses. I'm going to brag of my weaknesses. Why? So that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses and in insults and in hardships and persecutions and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Wow. Paul's request to Jesus was, please, Lord, take this away. Three times he pleaded with the Lord to do that. Jesus' answer was a principle of ministry which could be paraphrased maybe like this. Paul, where there's less of you, there can be more of me. And so I'm going to leave this weakness there because there's a whole lot less of you there. And that's where my light can shine through. I'm going to leave you in a mortal body. I'm going to leave you a little bit of a crack pot so that my light can shine through your difficulty. You see, it's not our talents we struggle most deeply with and surrender to God. It is the willingness to display our weaknesses. Paul's response was to glory in his weaknesses for Christ's sake and the sake of the gospel. Now, none of us need to glory in our weaknesses and our problems and everything for the sake of our weaknesses and our problems. That'd be, that'd be insane. He's saying, but I am willing if it will bring glory to Christ, if it will help someone see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, the life of Jesus Christ. And if it can bring them to eternal salvation, yes, I'm willing to suffer temporarily. It's for an eternal good. That's my calling. That's my purpose. That's your calling. That's my calling. We are called to suffer with him that we may may also share in his glory. Very important for us to understand that God wants to work through our lives. I want you to know that while we're all missing getting together, I hope you're missing and I am, uh, we're still connecting. We had several thousands of people connect last week online with us, and uh, we're grateful for that. Uh, We should all show up every week, okay? (laughs) I know some of you uh, connect every week anyway, and you're out of of the area, but it's very important to realize that we are a connected people through our love for Christ and through the Spirit that dwells in each one of us, the same Spirit. I want you to know that we love you and that we're praying for you, and I pray that you will pray that God will use your life during this time I felt it was important as a pastor for us not to have a united pity party, but to really think about what's God wanting to do with this? How does he want to use my life now? He wants to use you. That's not even up for debate. The question is, are you willing to be used? And what price are you willing to pay if he asks for that price? How much do you love him? How much do you owe him? Uh, think about that one for a while. But if he wants to use your life to bring somebody to eternal life, can he? Are you willing? Paul's saying we can penetrate their darkness. We can put the good news on such display that people suddenly wake up and go, wow, this is for real. Jesus is for real. And their lives will be transformed. When we become more like Jesus, true disciples... A disciple becomes like his master. Then evangelism becomes automatic because people look at our lives and go, wow, the way you love, the way you sacrifice, the way you live, the way you respond to difficulty is just so much different. The problem today is that so often Christians aren't different. And that's sad because we can be. We have a power in us that we need to learn to tap into. And it's infinite. 
We have an all, Paul, what did he call Paul it? Paul call it, he called it an all surpassing power. It goes beyond anything and everything. There is no difficulty that will come your way that can ever surpass the power that God has put in you. You need to learn to bring it online. The power can be there and be untapped. So by your faith and by your willingness to obey, because obedience is faith in action, that power will be released. And when you make the decision, there's an ocean of God's grace and power to fulfill that decision when you're doing something according to His goodwill. Love you guys. Pray that you will continue to trust Him. Look for opportunities to serve Him. Look for ways to encourage one another. I pray that as uh, we walk through this time that you will keep our president and vice president and our leaders in your prayers and pray that God will end this uh, plague quickly. But at the same time, don't ever waste a crisis. God knows how to use it for our good and for the good of others. God bless you. Have a good week. If you need anything, please call the office. Please reach out to us. Please connect with our daily devotionals. Uh, please connect with all the other ways that we're trying to get information to you and uh, minister to others. And please be faithful to help us here at the church. Our load has increased, not decreased, and there is more need, not less. And so for those of you who can help, please do so. And I know for some of you, uh, your resources have gone away temporarily. And we're praying that God will quickly supply that need. And if we can help in any way, please let us know. God bless you. You have a good week.